Yeah, we're, whenever you're ready, we're, we're rolling. Okay. Hi, I'm Gershon, and I have sexually abused children. And I'm Andy Pellin, a comedian. Because some topics, really, only a comedian can handle. This is no joke. This series is brought to you by 28. I was on stage enjoying a beautiful evening, hosting an event for a great organization, but there was something really distracting right in front of me, sitting front and center, was a convicted sex offender. Let me just point out there that this episode is definitely not intended for children. It may be hard to listen to, especially for those that are triggered by child sexual abuse. So after the event, I went over to him and, uh, and I asked him, like, you don't feel kind of weird coming to this event just out in the open, a community event where you abused in? And he said, listen, uh, I can't go to any event that is at a school, which most of these Jewish events are held at a school. This event happened not to be at a school, so he wanted to have a nice night out. Then I asked him, hey, would you be open to doing an interview, a podcast interview? And and the reason why I asked him is because there's a lot of people that are in denial, that feel someone like Gershon does not exist. And they do. They exist in the Jewish community, the non-Jewish community, the secular community, the Hasidic community. These people have their struggles, and when given into their struggles, they cause so much damage. And I think it's very important to protect our kids to be aware that most people are, are pretty good people, but these people do exist. So that's why I have here Gershon. I'm 39 years old and was born in Poughkeepsie, New York. I was raised in upper middle class, and then I uh, moved to Muncie when I was about two years old. Grew up in Muncie, went to see the yeshivas. My parents wanted me to have more of a chinuch. They wanted me to learn Yiddish. They sent me to Bells initially um, for yesh- for school. And then um, I went to Wien. I was in Muncie for elementary school. Then for high school, I went to schools in Manhattan. I have a, a you know high school degree, high school diploma and got married at age 22, and here I am now for this interview. Okay, if you're watching this, don't let that smile mislead you. We're about to go down a very dark road. But first, Gershon wanted to begin with a disclaimer. Go ahead. I'm aware that in publicizing my story, there will be people who will have changed the feelings towards me, people have concerns, discomforts, And I'm sharing this story in hope of all the healing it will bring to people, but I do request that people do not treat my kids and family any differently. So let's start with why are you doing this podcast? So I do have people who come to me now and share stories with me, um, whether it's a support group or in private or their struggles. Some of them would probably be alarming to people in the community. And maybe after this podcast, I'll have more of it. I actually have a relative who knew that I was going to be making this podcast. And that relative came forth to me about their struggle. Um, So this podcast has actually already started to have the effect that I wanted before it even occurred. Let's take a step back. For those that don't know, what were your crimes and who are your victims? So when people hear that somebody has offended on a child, the assumption is that they've offended on many children and... Frequently, that is the case. Um, How many total victims do you have? After the age of 18, I have two victims. Um, They're both from after marriage. Um, One is a relative who I abused for a period of seven years. And the other one is a non-relative who I sexually abused for a few hours in one day. Um, Not to minimize the experience that person went through, Um, But it was a minor girl, and it was somebody who I had feelings about the way that family was without going through details, but I had disappointments about that family, so I didn't respect the family so much. 
and and she sat down on my lap, and I was angry at my wife. Um, that's that. Um, another part of the offense cycle. Ooh, that, one second, one second, one second. Did you actually abuse your second victim right there in public, or were you grooming her in public to abuse her, you know, later in private? This is this is important for people to know what what exactly happened there. Um, so what I did with that girl, my other victim, is putting my cl- my hands under her clothing and feeling her genitals, um, and that I did on the front lawn of their house. With um, other people around? With other people around, yeah. Um, I did it discreetly. Um, I used my intelligence in a negative way to... I don't know if anyone actually saw what I was doing. Um, I was... And this is a general thing that predators um, resort to sometimes is roughhousing and more generally. And then once you're being physical, the child may not notice where the predator's hands are going. People not, may not realize where the predator's hands are going. And that creates that opportunity for, for offending without being noticed. Um, and you weren't afraid of getting caught? Um, I didn't actually care so much about being caught, which is another thing that predators go through sometimes. Um, at that point of my life, um, I had actually stayed up the whole night before, which is one of my triggers, a negative trigger. Um, there's a bunch of negative triggers, which for people who are struggling, I think is good to be aware of, um, non-sexual triggers. Um, so for me, it's important to me to sleep well, to eat well, to to have general things that make me feel good about my living situation, about my clothing, my job, just in general, to have myself well taken care of that I feel good about myself. Um, sometimes I struggle with that and I say, well, I've done this bad thing and I've caused those people to suffer. What right do I have to take care of myself? Um, and that's wrong on a few accounts. One account is that I'm a human being like any human being, and even though I've done bad things, I am a person that should live a human life. Um, but more in terms of the, the safety of myself and the community, the better I am, but the, the better taken care of I am in my personal life, the better off I'll be in the community. Um, and at that time, I was... I was... Um, one of my big triggers at that point was exhaustion. Um, and in being exhausted, I wasn't thinking rationally. So you irrationally abused your second victim. Was it a quick thing or was it over an extended period of time? What what exactly? Tell me exactly what happened over there. So touching that girl was for that period of play. Um, Personally, penetration has not been one of my attractions, so um, I didn't penetrate her, but what I did was in no way acceptable, and I just put my, not just, I put my hands into her or under her garments and enjoyed the pleasure of feeling her there. From my knowledge, that part of my story is more unique. I think um, everyone who I've spoken to um, understands that when somebody um, will either touch a child or use their body or even pornography or any of that stuff, it's using that as an extern- external stimulation in order to arouse them enough to, to reach um, ejaculation. Um, so I am aware of that that that's how most people are. In my personal story, I've never used any other body or any other image um, to reach ej- ejaculation. So help me understand. You just get excited? I mean, what, what does it do for you? Um, I'm like most other people that from touching bodies and also from visuals, I do get aroused and I could have an... Um, an erection from that, but I'm not, that's not what I need to reach the ejaculation. Okay. I'm just going to go a little bit back because I think it's important for people to understand. 
you are there abusing this girl in public without getting caught for how long? How long was that going on for? So for my second victim, it was one, it was over the course of one day, um, which doesn't make it okay, but it wasn't, it wasn't something that needed extensive period. I know some people have to intimidate their victims in order to try to not be reported. Um, I've never intimidated anyone. I've done it through the face of, through the front of, of, um, play. Um, I never really thought about being reported, um, but my primary um, victim or target, the touching, I did a lot. I did it at Fabringen's and Shoal. I did it um, at home. Um, but I, I was discreet about it. So if I had her sit on my lap and I could put my hands on her or it was, yeah, I would feel the person. Um, there are other predators who do other things that they need more sophisticated ways of keeping it um, undercover. Um, if they're having the girl, ma if the guy's having the girl masturbate him in public, um, or if he's having intercourse with a girl, um, because of the nature of my of my attraction and my desire, it was fairly simple for me to keep it discreet. And how many years was this abuse going on for? My primary victim is over a course of about six years. And your second victim, when you say you abused her for one day, does that mean many times over the course of one day? Um, my secondary victim was on their front lawn. Um, it was over the course of an hour or two of playing... Um, it wasn't really play. It was sec on my end, it was sexually offending, but I did it through the face of playing. And uh, every opportunity I had to stick my hands under the garment, that's what I did. Okay, I know I'm asking a lot about your second victim, but I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. You're at their house, their family's there, everything's in the public, and you're playing with the kids, and they're just thinking, oh, he's great with kids. Yeah, no, no one made anything of it. And how old was that kid? Six years old. That, that kid was six years old at the time. Do you think she knew what was going on at the time of the abuse? So, in my story, at the time of my offense, I definitely excused myself that my victims did not know what was going on, um, that there was no discomfort to them, um, that it wasn't abuse, and that kind of thing. Um, in, going, in learning more about the experience that victims have, I no longer ascribe to that. Um, I think that people have an internal compass of morals of what's acceptable. And even if they're not conscious of what's happening, because kids aren't that developed, but the body is aware of where it's touched. And people, even at a young age, have some minor sense of morals and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And at this point of my life, I consider what I did to be sexual abuse. And at, to some degree, I definitely um, assume that they were not okay with what I was doing. Um, even if at the moment, or in the moment, they were, um, seemed like a happy and pleasant participant in the activity. Um, I dressed it up in affection but now I know that it was not affection, it was sexual abuse. Looking back, when can you pinpoint that you had these, you know, indescribable urges? Uh, my earliest recollections is 
from the age of about three, I don't know, two and a half, three, from that age, age of my life, um, going to the mikveh with my father um, and enjoying looking at people's bodies, um, which my personal thing was always um, real human beings. I've never been attracted um, in a strong way to, to printed or electronic images. My father saw that he was taking me to the mikveh and I was attracted to looking at the body. So he had me standing outside of the mikveh. I remember wanting to change my, my sister's diaper um, and my father speaking to me about sneas and pritzas, um, which in English that's modesty or immodesty. And I felt that that was ridiculous, that I should be able to, I, mean, I wasn't to the dirt of the diaper, but in terms of the body and the body parts that are under the diaper, um, I felt that that's totally fine and acceptable. Growing up, um, I felt attracted to bodies of of uh, classmates, of relatives, um, and I use the word bodies because I objectified them. There weren't a people that were in a human relationship to me. It was just about the the physical body to me um, that I was attracted to and and uh, wanted to see, feel, experience. And over time, I I developed obviously. But from my initial attraction at age three in the mikvah of looking at people until I actually had a touch victim at age 14 um, was a matter of opportunity, largely. Um, Did it ever occur to you at the beginning that your victims were actually, you know, victims? So with one of my targets um, when I was 14, she... Initially, I felt that she was a willing participant. And at a certain point, I noticed that she was just freezing when I was coming into the room. Like she would just be still and not moving at all. So I took that as a nonverbal cue that she was no longer consensual and I stopped at that point. Um, and again, later on, she told me what she had been going through, the trauma that she had been enduring, fear that she would be raped fully and I would have intercourse with her. And while I was um, feeling her and touching her, that was, that was her experience, and that's the trauma that she went through. Remind me, how old were you at that point? At that point, I was about 14. And was she sleeping? No. My targets when I was 14 were awake. How'd you get them to agree? I mean, was it just an age difference that, that kind of gave you the authority? Um, so I was older than my targets um, and their family. So family has that closeness and that trust, um, which is a scary thing of who can you trust, but family does have that aspect to it. Um. So that's how I had the ability. In my understanding, most um, victims or most targets are family. Um, people who have that closeness and that trust and the accessibility. But if she would have initially said, I'm not okay with this, I would have backed off. I, would, I wasn't looking to traumatize anyone. I was just looking to pleasure myself. How old was she? She was a few years younger than me. So she was like 12? Um, a little younger. Than I, mean, I don't want to go through details, but she okay. was a few years younger than me. Just, just to get a range, was it one year, three years? Um, let's say between three and five years younger than me. How old were you when you made that jump from, in your mind, what you thought was possibly experimentation to when you knew, okay, you're a predator? I was 16 then. I offended in a classmate. Um, he wanted a, we were on a class trip. We, he wanted a massage. I massaged him to sleep. And then at that point in my life, I was, I was struggling with the masturbation idea. Um, and I was trying to wean myself off of it. I knew it was against halacha. Um, and I was kind of, I was like half committed, which is dangerous within itself. I'll put that out there. It's dangerous, but I was half committed to not masturbating, which meant I wouldn't use my hand to masturbate. 
Um, what that left me with was using another person's body. And so I used a classmate's body um, f for masturbating. And uh, I wasn't planning on ejaculating. And when I did ejaculate, I was shocked. And I jumped off of him and I ran to the bathroom. And in that process of jumping off of him, he woke up. Did he notice what happened? Yeah. How did he react to that? Um, he didn't confront me directly. A few days later after the class trip, a different classmate came over and said that the guy who I had been sexual with, um, ex like he, I need to apologize to him, which I did. Um, I said, I don't even know how to apologize. Um, and uh, he told me that um, he does not forgive me and he never wants to speak to me again. Did he ever speak to you again? No, we never spoke again. And with your new awareness, did you ever, you know, like reach out to him to apologize? Well, I had, I had made that initial apology to him, which he didn't accept. And he said he doesn't want to speak to me again. So one of the things that, the negative things that some people do is they'll keep on pursuing to try to get that apology and then to try to get the person to say, yeah, I forgive you. Um, some people don't want to apologize and they don't want to speak to the predator again. So it's appropriate to give them that space. Like you, in offending, you've violated their boundary. So violating the boundary again to apologize doesn't make it okay. You're again violating their boundary. Okay, let's zoom out and continue talking about your story growing up. So I'm going to do a quick skim over from age 14 till marriage. Um, I was attracted to people, males and females, and I did act out on a few of them. The intensity that I felt um, growing through teenage, my teenage years, um, there was a point that I was masturbating six times a day. Um, and I loved it and I felt really good about it. With the knowledge that I had been masturbating at a certain point six times a day and how much of my life it had occupied, um, that did make it a little easier to make the hachlata and say, whoa, this is like really big. I decided spiritually that this wasn't okay. And at about the age 19, I completely cut out any um, masturbation and sexual activity with anyone else from my life. I also made the commitment internally that my next um, ejaculation would be into the woman who would become my wife. I didn't know who that would be, but that was a commitment I made. Um, I don't know that that hachlata was a good thing, by the way. Um, Why not? Because that internal tension just grew tremendously. So maybe halakhically it's what I was supposed to do. Again, I'm not addressing the halakha part, but therapeutically I think it was a terrible idea to make that achlata. Um But I did keep to it. I mean, I am a strong person. I did keep to it. And the achlata was that I would not be sexual with anybody or, or masturbate until it was with my wife. I'll say good and bad to that because I did maintain myself. I didn't have any tools. I didn't have much knowledge. I just restrictive. I held it in um, and I wasn't masturbating and I wasn't being sexual with anybody else. So that was a lot of that time that I went to other countries and, and including in, in the United States and different states I was in. And I, I had a lot of exposure to a lot of kids and there were kids that I was uh, attracted to. Um, and including when we were all naked, like in the mikvah or in changing rooms at the at pool. I'm a lifeguard. So I had a lot of exposure to a lot of kids. Um, and when I say a lot, I'll say thousands, probably in the 5,000 kid range, maybe even more. Um, so I've had a lot of exposure and I've never offended on anyone just from that fear of the institution. Um, I worked in Satmar as well, and I didn't want, and they paid me. They were very nice to me in Satmar, and I felt it was a good job. And out of respect to the Satmar community and, and the Satmar administration, who was very nice to me, um, that was also something um, that I held internally, that I never offended on any of their students, as well as, as, well as the administration, Alitaira and, 
and uh, all the Lubavitch schools, and Darchem Menachem, and Lubavitch Yeshiva, and all that. Did you ever come close to breaking that vow? There were cert- certain points in my life that I got, even after that commitment, that I was close to offending on someone. Um, there was a time that I was in another country, a third world country, and I felt that I had the opportunity, and I was curious, like, what does a bris mila look like on a, on an, a grown-up kid? Um, so there were times that I did have the desire to to, to um, ask people or see or see body parts. Um, there was a different country I went to once. Um, again, as far away from the United States, where going there, I felt a certain secure a sense of security um, that even if I were to go and I were to offend on a kid that worst case I could just hop on a plane and come back to the United States and I would be um, I could not be held accountable for that um, when I got to that country one of my peers told me that there was actually someone a child in the community who had been offended against and that the perpetrator had indeed fled back to the United States and that the kid was now left um, to deal with it. And he and his family were now in therapy and having to deal with the abuse. So that was my, I was 20 at that time and that was my first exposure to the idea that being sexual with another person without their consent or specifically with a child, um, does leave an impact on the other person and they may have to have some kind of trauma to deal with. I don't know why that person said it to me. I've actually asked that person since, why did he say that to me? Um, And he doesn't know why he said it to me. Um, He barely even recalls saying it to me, but that was pivotal. Like when I went there and I was in that country for close to a year, um, that was something that I used to maintain myself. So back to the question of what could if I would have known earlier what would I have done, it's possible that I would not have offended. Um, so I definitely do feel it is important in, to educate. There should be an appropriate sexual educational classes um, given to... Um, bo- I'm only talking about the boy part of it, but so there should be sex ed classes given to, to boys as they reach um, puberty. Um, to understand about their body, to understand about their desires, attractions, that they're natural, they're not. I, I've had the sex ed talk with my with my son after he reached that age, and I, I made it clear to him that these are natural things and they're meant to be. Though. It's how Hashem designed you to be that way. In the olden days, people would get married at the age of 13, and that's when the body starts developing and being able to do different things and being attracted to things and you'll find your attractions changing and that's all kosher. Um, it's not okay to to act out upon it. Um, and I discussed with him that now, nowadays we don't get married at the age 13 or 14. Um, we get married at age 20, 25 and so now you're left with this baggage on your lap of saying, well, my body is ready for it, but society says I'm not ready for it, or me, maybe emotionally I'm also not ready to get married and have kids, a wife and kids. Um, it is something that kids need to deal with. Um, but not saying in advance, I think, is putting the person at a disadvantage. I feel that if I would have known myself better, I would have had better ways of handling myself. So what you were saying before is basically one guy telling you about some of the effects of abuse was enough to stop you, like stop you, actually stop you from abusing? Yeah. That one talk with that guy, um, I maintained myself um, for, I think, four years after that. And this lasted until you met your wife a few years later. Yeah. What was what was she like? I'll reiterate that I do have my wife's permission to speak to this to a certain degree. She was a base Yaakov girl, a base Rivka girl. She knew about learning Torah, about doing mitzvahs, maizim Um, Very sweet, very, just very pleasant. She's a very pleasant person. 
And I came into the marriage with a lot of energy and a lot of tension. I had all this tension backed up from, from years of withholding. And I was an explosive balloon. And she didn't relate to it. She thought I was gluttonous. Um, she thought that if she behaves in a sinistic way, that she'll influence me, that she'll change me. Um, and she had her own personal life. There were many dynamics of her own being tired and whatever it was. Um, so I came into marriage with this huge expectation, this huge sexual expectation of my wife. And I was left in shock. I didn't know what to make of it. I thought that you get married and boom, it's like nonstop sex or something. I, I don't know. It was, it was fantasy. It wasn't based on reality, but the reality wasn't anything close to what I had imagined. So I went in with all that baggage from not masturbating with all the, for all these years, that halacha part and the halachas of Nida, and just feeling that religion was working against me. What about children? How did that fit into your mindset? Were you uh, looking forward to having kids? So another component to my mindset at that point was that I felt that children would interfere with my relationship with my, life, my wife, my general relationship and my sexual relationship, um, which I'll stick in now, 15 years into my marriage, has not been the case at all. My children have not interfered. Then we had our first kid, which I felt really dumb about because I wanted to have more of my wife and I felt that I had caused us to have less. By the time we had, our, we were pregnant with the second kid, I just felt really dumb. Um, and the, there's a passage from Tehillim that resonated in my mind. It still does now sometimes. Um, which means I'm an animal with you. And I felt just like an animal goes to the pasture and he eats his grass. There's no choice. He goes and he eats. He's just stuck in that. And there's no choice. There's no emotion. There's nothing going on. He's just stuck in, in being that way. I felt like I was being a, a brainless animal. Um, we continued living together. We continued functioning. Um, we continued having kids. Um, and I continued to disintegrate on my inside. Um, I even remember once taking a walk, again, consumed in that grief, and all of a sudden a car beeped at me, and I was like, what? And a guy started screaming, do you not see that you're in the middle of a street, the lights are this way, and I could have run over you? And I had been completely oblivious. I was just totally consumed in my own grief. And I remember even thinking then, like, maybe you should have ran me over, and then I wouldn't, like, continue having more kids and, and more trauma and all that stuff. And I didn't really have words for it then, but that's the place that I was in at that time. Um, very self-absorbed. Um, from the outside, anyone who would have looked at me would have probably not seen that unless you were really keen on it. Um, I had a regular job and I, you know, I'd go work. I was with my wife, with kids, I'd go to school. I did all the regular things that all the regular people did. I kept all my grief buried inside of me. After a few years of marriage to my wife and feeling unsatisfied, that's when I gave myself permission. Um, in my personality, and there's all kinds of personalities, but in my life generally, I'm a doer person. If there's an issue, I resolve it. If something needs to happen, I do it. I do things right away. Um, so this was actually a big challenge to me if I have this issue. And what do I do? I couldn't speak to anyone, couldn't do anything. I just felt very restricted until at one point I was like, all right, enough of that. And I chose somebody to be sexual with. And how long have you been married at this point? Um, for me, that was, I believe, three years into marriage that I started um, with another person. And, and in my case, the person was a child. Did your wife ever protest? There was one time that my wife questioned me um, and she just, she said like, is, are you behaving in an okay way? I don't remember her exact words, but something to that effect. Like, is this okay what you're doing? Are you behaving in an okay way? And that was actually the only time I lied to my wife and I said to her, yes, what I'm doing is fine. And I don't need any help. I don't need anything. Um, and there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. Um, 
what what exactly were you doing when when she said that? So I was being very physical. Um, there were times that I would even be in my wife's presence, and we were very tzinius, whatever that means, but I'll use that word. We were very tzinius, and so I didn't touch her in public, um, didn't touch her at all during Nida. So there were times that I was with my wife and this other child, and I would just go straight to rubbing the child in a vigorous way. Um, I think to any person who was looking, they would find what I did inappropriate without even knowing the criminal part to it or the sexual part of it, just the physical rubbing, how obsessed I was with it, um, was not a healthy behavior of mine. Did you ever consider coming clean to your wife? I didn't know how to handle my relationship with my wife and my desires of my wife. I would say, I would say strange comments to her, like my sexual pleasure should be coming from my wife. Um, no, sorry, I, I would say my feminine pleasure should be coming from my wife. And she didn't know what to make of that. Again, she was a base Yaakov girl, a base Rivka girl that wasn't part of her school education, of her society education. So I didn't know how to say what I wanted. She didn't know how to interpret my messages. Not that she needed to. I was being cryptic. Um, I don't know that I was looking to redirect her attention to something else. Um, what I really wanted was from her and in the words that I could use now and self-understanding from now is I wanted her to know that I was not okay um, and that I wanted more from her and that if she doesn't supply me, then I would go to the outside. How do you think she feels about you coming forward about this? This is, I'm going to say something I wanted to start off with, that um, before doing this interview, I asked my wife how she felt about it and she acknowledged that in certain ways she will feel exposed, but she feels that this is good for me and good for people in general. It's good for society to have to have this story exposed and, and put out to the open in order to help people who may be having similar struggles um, in whatever way I can be an inspiration to anybody that's that's also struggling now. So... My wife does, in a certain way, feel exposed. Um, obviously, if I'm not satisfied sexually, then that means that she wasn't satisfying me sexually. Um, not that she has an obligation to, to to do so, but the fact is that she wasn't. And so that, in that aspect, exposes her. Um, and there may be other things that come up in this interview that expose her. Um, she is accustomed to being spoken about publicly, and we have discussed parameters within that, such a, that that would respect her privacy, the privacy of people who I've abused. So, and but she she is supportive of this interview. Um, along with that, it's also been discussed with my two oldest children, and they are also supportive of this video. How old are your kids now? Um, the age range of my children is um, just about seven. My youngest will, is having his birthday this week, and my oldest is 14 and a half. How many kids do you have now? I have. Um, I currently have six kids. And uh, for now, we're not planning on having any more. So as a parent with six kids to protect, let's try to learn from your experience. What kind of physical touch were you doing in public that should have been a red flag for abuse? Um, so there's always a gray area between touch that's completely fine and touch that's completely not okay. And part of the gray area is the intensity, the, the endurance of it, the frequency. Um, so for me, all three were on a high level. So like bordering 
whatever word you want to use, criminal, inappropriate, um, and the frequency, the endurance, the intensity. So it was that my behavior was definitely strange, even to someone who doesn't know the law and that kind of stuff. Um, even in self-reflection, I can look back and say that wasn't okay. Um, my touch was largely non-sexual, but there was always a sexual component to it. So when, if you ask like what other people would have seen, my touch was largely non-sexual, so there wasn't really a criminal part for someone to see. But you said your touch was strange. What was strange about it? I can pull out one specific. Um, I would wake up this child um, during their sleep um, to rub them. So that, I think, is clearly inappropriate and not acceptable. Um, In front of your wife? Yeah. I'll be honest, this is a tough conversation right now, but um, where on her body did you rub? On her legs, on her back, and also her private parts. Did you ever rub her private parts in front of your wife? No. And I actually, as my victim grew up, I switched from objectifying the, her to um, humanizing her, and I stopped defending on her. But again, all these limitations and boundaries and achlatas and mindsets made it worse for me, not better. So I wasn't doing the behavior, but internally I was doing worse. So on the inside, you're disintegrating. On the outside, you're more or less blending in. How did it all fall apart? How'd you get caught? At, at a certain point, I was completely abstaining from really anything with anyone outside, especially the people who I had victimized. Um, but I was, I was living in rage. I was, my eyes were peering everywhere, looking for any sexual outlet. Um, it was a very unhealthy place to be, even though I was physically not doing any behaviors that were criminal or not acceptable. But internally, I was just looking at everybody and everything. Um, at that point, a previous victim of mine went to somebody in this community in Crown Heights and reported what I had done to her in our childhood. And she said, although she doesn't have any indication of anything now, she asked that person to question me. And I was miserable at that point. And I was willing to speak to anyone. If there was any glimmer of any hope to get out of my situation, I pounced on it. So I completely disclosed to the person who came to me, and then that person went and reported me to the state, which we can have conversation about that as well. What, what should somebody do if they are aware of a fact that somebody has abused somebody, and even more so if, there's, if they're currently abusing somebody? Um, which, I'm just gonna answer that part. If, if you're aware that somebody is currently abusing a child and they're not willing to make any changes, absolutely report them immediately to, to the authorities to the police or whatever, whatever is appropriate. Um, but the fact is that the person did report me and then I was taken into investigation. An investigator spoke to me. I spoke openly to the investigator. I was, they recorded me on video. Um, I felt that I needed to get out of my mental prison and I do have to deal with a mound of legal issues now, a lot of therapy, um, but I'm, I'm also in a much better place now. Um, internally and in my relationship with my wife. So it's terrible of how I got to where I am now, but currently I, I am in a much better place than I was. Did you wind up going to prison and spending some time in prison? My lawyer made a plea bargain with the prosecutor. And so I had the choice of going to prison for, I think it was three to five years or going through this program in Minnesota. The Alpha program, which you had to pay $80,000 for. I know you went around collecting money for this program. How did people respond? So there's all kinds of people out there in the world. Um, some people are very sympathetic. Some people are in denial. Some people are very encouraging. Some people are furious at me. 
Um, there's all kinds of attitudes. Some people are confused. Some people are afraid. How do you how do you give a pitch for something like this? Um, specifically, when I went around fundraising, I was open with people. I said, "Hey, you know, I have this struggle, and I'm seeking help. And the alternative is prison. So I'm requesting assistance." In general, people were sympathetic at that point. Um, there was one specific person, I think of all the people I spoke to, that when I told him the little bit I just said, that he asked me if it's true, did I really commit the offense? And I told him, yes, it's true. And I saw an anger boil up inside of him. And he, he was very clear to me that in no way does he want to help me at all. But this person who refused to help me at all asked me how my family would be coping. And he gave my family $400 a month towards, my, towards the living expense um, for 18 months that I was not able to work. So either towards me or towards my family, there's been a lot of encouragement and, and support. Were you angry that the guy turned you away? No. Why? It's good for me to have people angry at me, actually. Um, not just have people that are, all, not only be having people that are encouraging and supportive, but to also have the experience. Um, so I'll say that as a general thing, people in the world, in the community, however you feel, be natural towards the person who you're speaking to. Talking about being natural, you seem way more comfortable right now in this interview than I expected. I mean, giving the subject matter and how personal it is. So in my time in Minnesota, where I was in inpatient therapy for a year and a half, then outpatient therapy for a year and a half, I had to do many presentations. There wasn't a camera then, but it was with a group of people analyzing every word I say. You learn a little so, public speaking at the program. I'm, I've worked publicly, so it's not my first time. I'm, I've, I've spoken to groups of people. What kind of groups? Um, I used to I used to be a Korea teacher. I mean, I still am a teacher. I just don't do that for a living anymore. For a living? You mean you still teach? You don't lose your skills. I'm just because I committed an offense doesn't mean I lost who and what I was. But I primarily worked with children. I primarily worked in schools. And so that part of my life is over. Um, I have my own kids that I can work with. I, I have a student now that's, I guess, between 50 and 60 years old. Um, a guy that's becoming associated with religion. So it's very exciting to me to like not have totally lost that part of me. Um, it's an appropriate student for me, and he's learning Korea now. He already completed the Aleph base and just about done with Nakudas, and he's already moving on to reading real words. So for me, that's exciting to be able to maintain that. So back to your story. You avoid prison time by going to this program in Minnesota. What was that program like? When I went to Minnesota for the inpatient therapy, um, there's a person there, his name is Rabbi Shagalov. Initially, I thought he was just a local rabbi bringing food, very nice. Now, a lot of shluchim would do such a thing, and that is beautiful. But in addition to that, I learned that he is a sex therapist. So he would read all my papers and all my presentations and and the comment to me, I had religious questions. What kind of religious questions? Um, like one of the questions that I had to deal with was one of the foundations of the program is healthy masturbation. Um, to have a, a program in which the person isn't excessively masturbating and isn't um, depriving themselves. So to have a healthy masturbation plan, which many people struggle with that. My question was, my question was, how does that work for me as a Jewish religious person? And what's the Jewish perspective on that for non-Jewish people? And his answer to me was that the restriction on masturbation was just a Jewish thing. And for non-Jewish people, there's no restrictions on it religiously. Um, obviously, it has to be within healthy limitations and uh, healthy limitations and, and legal legal images, fantasies. Why was there such a strong emphasis on, you know, the kind of images? So when people are acting out in all kinds of ways, um, they start with something either criminal or unhealthy, 
and then they act upon that. What the what the alpha program did was it had something called processing, which means following through. Initially, a person can have a flash of glamour. This looks exciting. This looks really good. I want to do that. It'll give me pleasure, um, which may be a reality to many people. But if the reality is continued, and after you have that flash of pleasure, what would be the outcome of that? That's called processing. How would it affect the victim? What would the victim think, feel, and do? What would the victim's family think, feel, and do? What would my community think, feel, and do? What would my um, family think, feel, and do? And processing and going through the whole thing to the most probable outcome, and then to think of how that affects me, um, that's a way of initially addressing that fantasy. And then after that, after a person has subsided that fantasy, it's important in the alpha um, frame, in their, in their model, in the alpha model, to have legal and healthy fantasies, to have images that are healthy and legal, and to um, readjust the mindset in order to have the attraction and the desire and the pleasure from healthy and legal images or people. Um, initially in the alpha program, it's only images um, that they use as the program proceeds in order to graduate, a person has to actually find a romantic partner, um, whichever orientation they are, and has to actually have sex or be sexual with that partner. It's a requirement that um, to show the program, and it's a whole system you have to go through. The, the partner has to be brought into the program, the disclosure has to be made. Um, but to graduate, you do have to show the program that you're able to have a real human relationship. What was the biggest breakthrough you had from the Alpha program? The idea of the person on the other end having their experience being different than mine was completely foreign to me. I, it wasn't something that I that I was aware of, that I imagined, that I even considered. Um, it was all about me and what I needed and what I wanted. Um, after going to Alpha, I've and from that one relative who reported back to me how her experience, um, I had a surprise that oh, it's not just about me and my experience. There's another individual here who has a completely different experience than I'm having. And to them, it's not an experience of pleasure. and It's an experience of being abuse and trauma that comes along with that. How effective was the Alpha program, you know, judging by the group you were with? Um, I think I saw probably about 60 to 80 people go back to prison from the program because they were not able to um, hold themselves within the parameters of a healthy life. And each person had their own, their own situation where that happened, but a lot of people are not able to do that. Somebody who I've spoken to offended on, on minors, sexually abused minors, went through a therapy program, same as I did, Alpha in Minnesota, and got out of the therapy, and he was gay. He, his attraction was to men. And he spoke to a rabbi, someone who's called a rabbi, and this rabbi told him that the cure for being gay is to get married. So he listened to the rabbi. He got married and he had kids, um, but he was still gay and his attraction was still to, bo to men and boys. And he was unfulfilled with his wife and he went and he continued offending on children. After graduating this program, um, on the advice of someone who's called a rabbi. So for anyone who's a rabbi, I caution, there are times that you need to refer somebody to a therapist. There are also many people who are able to live the healthy life and the legal life and in our community to re live a religious halacha life and, and not do things that are offensive. Um, and I believe they should be, give, be given that opportunity. And how to differentiate that is a complicated question that um, professionals have to deal with. Which I encourage you to hear from the professionals I speak with in the next two episodes about this episode. But back to this episode. When I say professionals have to deal with, um, regular people also have to deal with it. So 
I committed my offense 10 years, 11 years ago. Uh, my primary offense was 11 years ago. But people don't know that, so people are afraid. They don't know what my offense was. They don't know how to be careful and what they should be careful with. So 11 years later, last week, I was in a shul, a local shul, and now is there a night for for bringing? On my way out, one of the people of the shul followed me out and made it clear to me that I'm not wanted in the shul. That's a family shul, and and that I shouldn't come back. So there is that aspect of my life that that will continue following me. Um, there's a saying: if you serve, if you commit the crime, then you serve the time. Um, it's not that concrete. It's not that I served the time, I went to the program, and now I'm good, or now I'm freed. Um, people will probably eternally have concerns and fears about me and uncertainties, and and uh, when I'm in shul, people are nice to me. Most people aren't saying anything, but I imagine that people are eyeing me suspiciously and wondering if I really belong in shul, if I really belong in the community. Um, how safe the shul is if I'm in the shul. So that's something that I carry with me. Um, have you have you been kicked out of a shul at this point? There are a number of shuls that have asked me not to come to them. Um, the number is two, two shuls in Muncie and two shuls in Crown Heights. Did they kick you out on the spot or did they reach out to you afterwards and said, hey, please... Don't come back. Um, all, all five shuls have said it out of the moment. Different shuls did it in different ways. Some was a phone call, one shul was a letter. Um, the last one I mentioned was face-to-face -face on my way out. Um, they were all done respectfully. Um, so I've, I'll say thank you to all those shuls, all the people of the shuls who treated me with dignity, but they also were concerned for their safety and they made it clear that I'm not welcome to come back again. How did being banned make you feel? So I like to think of myself as a regular and a good person. So it feels very hurtful and shameful to be told that I'm not a regular or a good person and that I'm not welcome to come to Shul, to any place, including Shul. Um, I understand that the concerns will be eternal. So I'm, I'm prepared for it, but it does feel shocking each time it happens again. And I know they have a point. People should be um, looking out for the well-being of the community and for their own children. I have children myself. I want my children to be safe and I want my children to be well taken care of and I want that the places they go to, the playgrounds, the shuls, the schools, um, should be safe places and I can appreciate the desire to keep the safety. So I know my struggle, I know where I am and I know that people don't know so they need to have a, a broad concern and that's going to be part of my life. Have you ever banned yourself? knowing your history. I was once in shul in Purim, and they had a Purim costume contest. And so a whole bunch of kids dressed up in all their costumes. And then they needed somebody who was an adult and not a father of any of the kids there to be a judge for the costume contest. And the then president of that shul did not know my story. And so he came over to me and said, you know, just ask me, do you have any kids in the contest? And the was an adult. And I said, no. So he said, okay, can you be a judge? So I quietly told him that I cannot be involved with anything with kids. Um, what, what happens now when, a, let's say, a kid comes up to you? I don't initiate conversation with any children. Um, if any child does initiate conversation with me, and it happens, where's a sitter, where's a page, can you something for me? I could be at the sink and the little kid can't reach the, the faucet. Um, I'm not looking to be obnoxious and rude to the kids or make the kid feel bad that they're ignored. 
Um, but it's definitely on me to make the interaction as short as possible. So you need a cup of water, here's a cup of water, and I'll walk away immediately. Or whatever the dynamics are in the moment. You want to reach a sitter. Um, and I've had kids come over to me and ask me questions in shul. Um, that's one thing. Another thing is, an absolute by me, is not to sit in your minors. Um, aside from my own children. Um, I, I endeavor to to be with, to sit among adults and to sit next to adults or at the end of a bench or however I set it up that I'm not sitting with any minors. Um, in general, I choose not to try not to interact with minors at all. So if there's a kiddish after davening and they're setting up the tablecloth, you know, if I'll take one end of the tablecloth and a kid takes the other end of the tablecloth, I might just say, actually, no, I'm not gonna be doing this now. I'm not gonna do the activity with the child. Um, another situation, and I try not to have like harsh reactions to things. I don't want kids to be startled from me, um, even independent of the sex attraction of, of just like regular interactions. If I go to Simchas Taira and there's dancing, I'm not excluding myself from the community celebration, but I'll make sure that I'm only holding the hands of adults. Um, but it does occur in the cir within the circle that, you know, I'm holding two adults' hands and one of them backs out and the kid will try to grab my hand. And at that point, it's too bad. It doesn't matter if it jars someone. I just jump out of the circle, and the, whatever happens to the circle is on them. But I'm not going to hold any kid's hand at any celebration. I also once had a kid actually sit down on my lap in shul, um, which now I'm much more careful about. I mean, not just much more careful. It's absolutely um, 10 steps before that careful. No one's going to sit on my, No one is not my child will sit on my lap. And even my own kids, I'm cautious about. So those are some personal examples, and every shul really needs to think about the dynamics of the shul, the physical setup of the shul, what um, securities, if there's people to watch the person. I know there's a shul that I attended that the rabbi had somebody actually watching me during the entire time that I was in shul. And that person knew that I had sexually offended against a child, and therefore I needed to be watched. So that is a legitimate um, thing for a shul to do as well. A lot of shuls don't have the awareness or bandwidth to monitor things properly. So based on your experience, how can I arm my kids so they don't get abused? One of the primary factors in offending is a person goes into fantasy and says, well, here's a, a person, a body, a personality, or something that, that looks pleasurable, and I'm going to go and partake in that pleasure. So with regards to my kids, what I think is important, and I would tell this to all kids, is that they should verbalize, I'm not a willing participant and I'm not okay. I don't know if kids wouldn't use that word, but the words that a kid could use is, I'm not okay with this. And kids are little and adults are big and kids don't have any power over adults. They can't stop them from doing something. They can't make them do something. But the adult is coming in with this fantasy of, wow, this is beautiful and pleasurable. And when the kid says, I'm not okay with that, that's the kid's power of draining the excitement of the, of the fantasy. And from my knowledge of people, myself and people who have offended on children, um, when a person hears such a message that I'm not okay with this, then it, when the excitement, that drains the excitement and then there's no interest in continuing with this child anymore. Um, it also sets a strong boundary of the child. Like, you're, you're going to do what you're going to do, but my boundary is that I'm not okay with it. And what the predator frequently tries to do is break down the victim's boundaries and, and, and just have them be open to whatever. And when the, when the target... Um, initially says, I'm not okay with it, and they're, they're, setting, they're setting the stage. There is a boundary here, and it's not budging. So that's something that's always important for a kid to be able to say. Did any of your victims try to put up boundaries? In my experience, my personal experience, there was never any boundaries. There was... How do I say it? No, I mean, the, 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 my, the victim, the people who I've um, illegally had sexual relations with have never in the moment said anything against me. Um, although in my personal story, 
when I reached out to people in a negative way, when I was looking for a target, um, I did frequently, I, I don't have that many targets, but of the few targets, of the targets that I have, and we're not going to minimize them because each one is valuable and important and, and sensitive, each of those people, um, and their stories also deserve recognition. Um, a lot of them were sleeping. So they, they weren't even in a position to to um, say no. And your victims that were awake? The way that I set up the situation was in a embracing, in a, in a very physical, like more hugging way. Um, so my victims who are little, I don't think we're in a position to set any boundaries or to, or to, or to verbalize discomfort because I was acting in a way that showed um, endearment and, and friendship. So that's a general thing to be aware of that many predators come with a smile and they're um, very nice, normal people who do all the regular things, and they also have this attraction or desire. I'm not looking to make everyone afraid of everybody, but I do believe that everyone should take um, rational boundaries and concern, have rational concerns and just have appropriate boundaries. So I was acting in ways that were irregular, and so my wife raised concern. She didn't know what to do about that afterwards. Um, and my message, one of my messages to people now is, if you see something that looks irregular, find out more, ask questions, pursue it, dig deeper. Um, and if the person is closed to discussing it, that's more of a reason to have more concern. I think that it's important for the community as a whole, and I'm not just saying about shul, I'm saying the community as a whole, shuls, um, schools, shopping centers, um, any place that has public gathering, it's important for people as a whole to be aware that there are people who are struggling and there should be an awareness. And I think the more of the awareness and acceptance that people are struggling, the more it keeps the strugglers in check of knowing, hey, there's people out there watching. Um, like for me to have that person come over to me in shul and say, you're not welcome here, I'm assuming it was a challenging thing for him to do, an emotional draining activity for him. But on my end, I know there's people that are concerned, whether they're actually coming to my face and saying it, or they may be hiding in shul and, and thinking it, but there are definitely eyes that are watching me. And I believe that's thanks to conversation that does occur in the community. So I encourage that to continue. Has there been anything done as a community that kept you Personally, from Personally, when I was a teacher in Crown Heights, there was an organization, I forget their name, um, you could put it in the comments if you want, if you remember, but there was a, a, an organization that called all the teachers of Crown Heights to the Oliteria Ballroom. Um, it was a massive meeting of all the male and female teachers from all the schools, and we were given a training, and that was actually uh, meaningful and supportive to me and informative to me and helpful to me. Um, a training on... And, and awareness. So what a, uh, words that I can use now, a victim of trauma, of abuse, of predators, of all these kinds of words, I got a language for it and, I, and it helped me maintain myself and it made me aware of, of my safety in general. So I actually wanted to be safe and wanted people to be safe with me. I appreciated there being windows and there being video cameras. Um, and I made sure never to go to less seclusion in a corner. Um, I don't think there's any way to make complete prevention. I think every school has a closet or a corner or a roundabout or something where if somebody's adamant, they will find a way to abuse. I remember when I was working in Alatera, um, there were there were rooms that were kind of like closets, these small rooms um, that tutor. I was a tutor, and we'd go into the room. I'd be in seclusion with a child, and after this big meeting in Alatera, um, they cut out windows in all the doors, and there was no more seclusion. So um, I think that was a great move on Alatera's end. Um, 
once they had the closed rooms, other schools in Crown Heights don't actually have any closets like that or closed rooms, and every room has windows. So I believe Darchim Menachem is like that, so good for them as well. Did Jewish or secular laws play a role in keeping you in check at all? So until about the age of probably 26 or 27, I was completely ignorant to the law. I was just unaware that there were even laws about legal sexuality and illegal sexuality. It wasn't something that I picked up in the street that anyone spoke about. So the law was never a component of of holding myself back. Um, I wasn't aware that the person on the other end was having a different experience than me, a negative experience. So that also wasn't a factor that ever held me back. So really the, the only thing I had was the religious component. Um, and I wasn't developed in my own morals. Like in my life in general, it was more about, well, what does the Torah say? Or what does Chesedah say about this? It wasn't about how do I feel about it? And what are my values independent of the Torah? I was actually searching in halacha for my sexual outlet, and then I found, I'm not going to discuss who my victim was, but I found a way of excusing my behavior from the Torah. You're aware that logic Uh, is very twisted, disturbing, and your average person doesn't go even near that road. Um, Is there anything you think in your childhood that you can attribute to that kind of mindset and to your struggle in general? Um, As a child, I did not feel neglected or abused by my parents. Um, I'll say certain chitzonistic factors, like my parents got divorced when when I was 19. Um, But the fact that they're divorced indicates that there was an undertone of something that wasn't right. Um, So while I don't have words for it, um, I'm sure that, that that their feelings towards each other impacted my perception of them and my feeling of safety and comfort with them. Um, I believe that I was not cuddled much when I was little. Um, that's something that I crave now. Um, I suspect or I believe that um, that craving stems from not having been sufficiently cuddled when I was a kid. And the word sufficient is a strange word because I don't know what that means. Like if they would have been 10 more minutes, 15 more minutes, an hour, I don't know what would have made the difference. Um, But I do suspect and believe that I could have been cuddled more as a kid and been more pacified then and have less of a neediness for the rest of my life. What would you say to your 14-year-old self? Um, My message to myself is that what I'll speak to my 14-year-old self. What you're going through is normal. It's regular for people to to have desires and attractions. Um, It's not okay to create victims. Um, You need to find ways of taking care of yourself. You need to work out with a mashpia or somebody if it's a healthy masturbation plan or maybe a no masturbation plan, but some kind of plan that you're not just living hiskafia, that you're not living um, cramped up in your desires, but you have expression of self. And you need to find lots of ways that are impactful on you, that you feel good about yourself, separate from your sexual being, and maximize that. Um, There will be a time in your life that is appropriate for you, which in our Jewish religious life, that's after marriage, there will be a time that um, it will be appropriate for you to be sexual and have sex, and hopefully you and your wife will have a wonderful sex life together. But for now, know that you're not stuck. The time will come, and that you need to manage yourself for the time being. And mostly is speak to people about it, because your classmates are also struggling and and people in the community is, are struggling, and all the adults who you look at, who they look like they're in total control and all good with themselves, um, most of them have had struggles when they were kids, and many of them still have struggles now. Even in the Alter Rebbe's presentation in Tanya, 
when he wants to give an example of an avera that everyone has violated, um, he uses the avera of masturbation. In Hebrew, it's chan chatas neorim. Um, it's not okay that people do the avera, but you're not different that you have done the avera. There are definitely those that are listening to this that unfortunately share similar struggles as you. Give give a message to those people. Um, a message to the struggling person, especially if you're on the verge of abusing somebody, is that this is a person who's going to be affected by you. There's all kinds of ways that people can be affected. It doesn't mean they will be affected in any specific way, but people... Um, can have a very negative self-image after this. They can have immense shame. They can have um, struggles socially, emotionally, school dropouts, various addictions. Um, even some victims go to the extent of suicide. So um, that moment that you're having your pleasure can have a profound effect on another person, um, to the fact that halacha may even consider you to be a raidef, a murderer who needs to be killed. So the first step to you is to not keep it a secret. Reach out, find somebody, find a close friend, find a, a therapist, a mentor, a mashpia, a support group. Um, support group is my highest recommendation. You'll go into a group and you'll hear all kinds of people that have all kinds of struggles. Um, I personally go into support groups and I can say what I'm struggling with or what my offense was and people go, oh, okay, so that's what you're struggling with. And they'll say, and this is what I'm struggling with. And it's a community where you can find um, space for healing, internal healing, because as somebody who's struggling, you're hurting as well. Um, there's an expression, hurt people, hurt people. Um, so if you're hurting inside, you're probably hurting somebody else on the outside also. Um, so I strongly encourage you to be part of this. Um, I am very fortunate to be able to um, be a free person and be able to have the knowledge and the tools and the therapy that I've received. And I encourage you to go and... Do the same for yourself. Would you consider yourself healed? Would you consider yourself not a danger? Would you consider yourself not a predator? I don't believe in such a thing as being healed from attraction, from attraction going away. Um, I don't envision myself ever changing. Um, I believe my role is to be aware of myself, to manage myself. Um, and to use an appropriate outlet, which is largely my wife, um, to get the pleasure that I need. But I've been through years of therapy. I've had great therapists. Um, I've been incriminated. I'm under the law. I have nice things. I have not nice things against me and supporting me, all kinds of ways. But my attraction to children will never go away. And it's something that I will eternally have to manage. Wow. There's definitely a lot, a lot to process in this episode. So let me help you out. Check out our next two episodes where we have experts that give their take on what you just heard. One is Dr. Michael Solomon, a psychologist who's an authority on this topic. And Patty Fitzgerald, who has educated countless parents, educators, and kids on how to stay safe. <laughs>